welcome to Venture Capital with me, Katie Pilby. This week, China has been putting the glitz back into gold. But is it all about savvy investments? Or are we witnessing the transformation of the global financial system as we know it? Analysis on that one plus. Is Britain ready for the shale gas revolution? We'll weigh up the pros and the cons. Corporate news to come, as well as checking in with our in-house investor here, Sean Thomas, to find out what he's been working on in terms of the Russian stocks and how his 10,000 US dollars is performing. That's all still to come. But first of all, let's talk about the Eurozone because the region is officially out of recession. It's been a roller coaster ride for the Eurozone since 2008 when the wheels began to give way and the only direction seemed to be down. But the mechanics of the system seem to be coming together, well, some parts of it anyway. Uh, the region ha as a whole has grown 0.3% in the second quarter of this year after enduring six months of contraction. Now, in the front row seat is Germany along with France, as you can see there. But what about the rest of the Eurozone passengers? Well, the likes of Spain and Greece demonstrate that the ride as a whole may not be entirely safe just yet. Now, for more on these latest growth figures, I'm joined by Steen Jacobson from Saxo Bank. Hi, Steen. Good to have you with us today. Can you tell me what was your initial reaction to the fact that the Eurozone is now officially out of recession? Well, first of all, of course, it's, it's great news that we are finally seeing some sort of attraction on the, on the growth perspective. But I also must say that I'm very skeptical about the ability to maintain this momentum. As if you look at the underlying uh, uh, data, which is going to support growth long term, uh, unemployment rates still elevated, um, lending in the s uh, banking sector very limited, and, and, and my, my key issue being that you remain without the SMEs, the 80 percent of the economy being activated. So skeptical, but happy to see that you're finally having a little bit of a success. I think back in 2008, 2009, if you'd have said to somebody then we'd be having these kind of conversations in 2013, there would have been a real fear factor going on. Having said that, do you see the Eurozone sticking together now? I think Europe has locked itself in a corner. It's painting itself into a corner where it's very difficult to extract itself from unless we get a new crisis point. Because I think the, what we learned from the history of the last five to six years in Europe is that the only changes that is mandated in Europe comes when the market is pressuring the politicians or you see uh, stock markets coming down. So unfortunately, uh, like in history, I think the only way we get new resolve and mandate for change will come through that exact new crisis crisis point, which I think will be uh, back to our starting point of weak growth. What we risk right now is clearly a Japanization in Europe, doing nothing, doing too little, and awaiting reforms to happen naturally. It will not go that way, unfortunately. Okay, so Steen, Eurozone not out of the danger zone yet then? No, but you know, any news is good news in terms of positive growth. But overall, we need to see the structural balances, imbalances being uh, dealt with, and then we can have some hope. But I don't think we're too far away. But it's not going to be in 13, and probably not in 14. Right. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That's Steen Jacobson from Saxo Bank. And a global shift is happening. China is set to take over from the U.S. and become the biggest consumer of oil this year. Now, one of the main reasons for this shift is the U.S. is becoming less reliant on foreign oil because their domestic supply has been revolutionized by shale gas. Now, talking of shale gas, one place where fracking has sparked a huge debate is the U.K. Now, on the pro-fracking team is the British Prime Minister David Cameron, who thinks development of the shale gas will create much-needed jobs, an estimated 74,000 in fact. Now, here are some of the other benefits Mr. Cameron is claiming as well. Uh, but environmentalists are leading the anti-fracking campaign, and, and here's the reasons. Now, according to the latest estimations, 500 years' worth of gas supply is lying uh, beneath Britain right now. So how is shale gas actually extracted then? Well, let's have a look. So the process of fracking involves drilling a hole deep into the dense shell rocks that contain 
contain the natural gas. Then pumping in at a very high pressure, vast quantities of, of water, air mixed with sand and chemicals. And this opens up these tiny fissures in the rock. Now through which the trapped gas can then escape, it bubbles out and is captured uh, and brings it all the way to the surface and then, and then it's piped out. Now I asked Chris Weaver, a senior partner with Macro Advisory, whether fracking is the way forward for Britain. Now, as to what impact it will have on the overall economy, of course, is very much the, the, the open, open question. Uh, if the UK can develop the resource to the extent that the optimists are now saying, then no question about it, it will considerably lower the energy base or the energy cost for UK industry and boost the competitiveness of UK manufacturers and UK industry in, uh, in, in general. And that's what the U UK government is looking at. They see that shale gas and shale oil has been been a boost to the U.S. economy and has been at least one of the factors in the U.S. economy pulling out of this slump um, and showing decent growth uh, this, this year. So, you know, the UK uh, government are, is looking for ways that it can also sustain what is still a very fragile recovery in the UK economy. And moving on to some corporate news then here in Russia, find out what the biggest business stories that are rocking the country are. And we'll start with Russia's Rosneft, the world's biggest publicly traded oil producer, Sills Key, Azerbaijan oil and gas deal. Azerbaijan is the third biggest oil exporter in the former Soviet Union after Russia and Kazakhstan. Russian billionaire and metals magnate Oleg Deripaska is suing Montenegro for $1 billion over factory closings. PayPal is launching ruble transactions starting from September. The Russian ruble will become the payment system's 26th currency. Checking in with our in-house investor here at RT, Sean Thomas, to find out how he's been getting on with Russian stocks. Hey, Sean, good to see you. So as we know, you were given 10,000 US dollars mm -hmm. to invest. It's your second week in the job, so we are expecting results. Uh, tell us how you've been getting on. Well, uh, I was expecting results too, but I'm going to have to say, wow, this is confusing. Okay, so when the numbers are going up and down and the charts and graphs are all over the place, when it's going down, that's bad, right? So, yeah, it's um, bad. Okay, so Rusal, <laughs> I decided I was going to like have some faith in Deripaska because you know he had this idea to look to the east. Not a good thing. I took a bath, a nosedive. It went down. I'm getting out, getting out, getting out. Down 4.72 percent, and still falling. I'm just going to get out of the metals business altogether. Rusal, being the largest aluminum company in Russia, it's not doing too well at this point in time. Some good news though. Uh, we talked about telephones. Uh, and Megaphone, they had a pretty good week. They've been up, not as bad as Rusal's been down, but they're, they're up about 0.8%, so didn't lose my shirt in this whole new thing, but man, this is confusing stuff. Wow, it sounds really confusing, and you've got your shirt on, so that, that's good news. It, indeed. Um, well, well, also, Rusal, uh, they're actually having some uh, meetings this week to talk about even closing down some of their facilities, so it really is... Uh, time to get out on that one as far as I'm concerned. Okay, and what's up your sleeve uh, for next week? All right, so energy, oil, everyone talks about how Russia is like an energy giant and this is what they know. So I'm going to try and do some recuperating uh, from this huge Rusal loss. I'm going to go into Gazprom and see what I can do on the oil side of things uh, because I hear Gazprom is rallying. In fact, they're up 2.4%. So I think uh, I'm going to look to the future and look to the energy uh, stocks this week, Katie. Okay, energy, Gazprom, that's what you're all about. Uh, Sean, we'll be checking back with you next week to see what you've been up to. Stay away from metals. You've had a bad run of it and megaphone as well. So at least you've got a bit of direction. All right, Sean Thomas, a fully clothed Sean Thomas just there. We'll see you next week. All right, thanks. China has been building up its gold reserves in record numbers in preparation for what some see as a revolution of the global financial system. Now, this current buying spree is fueling speculation that China is preparing to adopt the gold standard. Now, this follows comments made by a member of the People's Bank of China Committee calling for a new system to stabilize global exchange rates. So, this is where all the gold is right now. You'll be able to see behind me. And as it stands, the U.S. holds the world's largest 
gold reserves. But it is suspected that China has up to 10,000 tonnes, surpassing that of the US. So are the dominating days of the US dollar as the all-powerful reserve currency over? Well, I'm going to get some expert analysis right here from Dr. William Wilson from the Skolkovolt Business School. So tell me, presuming that China is, is doing this on purpose, this is why it's buying up all the gold, uh, is this the right decision? Is this the right way forward? Well, we know China's been buying gold in recent years. We don't know how much gold. Uh, the Chinese officials have not released any official statistics on it. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, we know this. The, the Chinese have 3.5 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. That's mm -hmm. about 50% of their GDP. And uh, they're worried about the value of the dollar, the world's major reserve currency, uh, five, ten years from now. So they're looking to diversify those massive foreign exchange uh, uh, reserves. And this is probably the primary reason why they're buying gold, have been buying gold in, in recent years, uh, diversification. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this all comes from the fact that the U.S. has an absurd amount of debt right now? I mean, we, we say 16 trillion, but it could be 15 to 100, some estimates. Is that what's, what's fueling uh, this diversification? One of the primary reasons, uh, the uh, U.S. national debt now is $16 trillion uh, and projected to grow uh, quickly over the next few years. Mm -hmm. Uh, although the dollar remains the world's primary reserve currency, about 80 percent of the uh, uh, of reserve currencies are held in U.S. dollars. But there's a concern. If you look at the Federal Reserve assets, they've tripled uh, in size over the last three years. So looking down the road, uh, there's obviously concern among Chinese authorities about uh, a dollar inflation, mm. the dollar eroding in value. And so this is the primary reason for diversification, for buying gold and getting away from the U.S. dollar. Mm -hmm. And what would this do, again, presuming that they are intending to do this? What would it do for Chinese growth? Yeah. Well, really no impact on Chinese growth. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem right now, the Chinese have a very tight control on the capital account. There, there, there's no... Uh, we won't see the, uh, the Chinese currency, the renminbi, become mm -hmm. a reserve currency anytime soon. Right. It, it, may, it, it may be decades away. The fact is, um, outside of China, no one uses the Chinese currency. Mm -hmm. Only the Chinese use it. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're a long way away from, from being a reserve currency. Right, OK. Well, what is the US dollar? What is the biggest rival? Does it even have one at the moment? Is there a feasible currency out there to take its place? It's got a modest rival right now, the, uh, of course, the euro. Mm -hmm. About 15 percent to 20 percent of, of uh, uh, reserves are held in euros. Uh, but given the, uh, the very acute structural economic problems you see now in the eurozone, um, I think the euro's future is very much in doubt. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll go back to China. Why, why, why has China been buying gold? Why are they interested in making their own currency much more powerful, mm -hmm. much more internationalized? Because they don't have a whole lot of trust in the euro. They don't have a whole lot of trust in the U.S. dollar, mm -hmm. and, which is why they're moving as fast as they can to make their own currency more internationalized. Uh, Dr. William Wilson, thank you very much indeed for coming into the studio today. And that's it for today's edition of Venture Capital. For more business news, market analysis and exclusive interviews, join me same place, same time next week. See you then. Goodbye. Oh, we're just gonna...